Welcome back to Storytelling Without a Script. I'm Matt Connor, and I'm going to assume you've found a great subject to film. You must have. You've decided to make a movie about it. But what mode are you going to use to do that? What's a mode? Well, if you've wondered about the different ways filmmakers approach shooting their documentaries, you might have jumped online and come across something called the six modes of documentary storytelling. If you haven't, these are basically six subgenres that have developed over the years, one of which your documentary will end up falling into whether it wants to or not. Now we'll get into what I do and don't agree with about these labels in a minute, but for now, let's run through the list and work out what the six modes are. And these films usually set out to evoke a feeling rather than truth. Linear structure and continuity often don't mean a thing here. Poetic documentaries are like poetry. It's all about the feels. They're made purely to elicit an emotional response. Usually with no dialogue or direction, they rely almost exclusively on the imagery to tell a story. And even with such limitations, usually manage to convey a very particular point of view to sway the audience's opinion toward that of the filmmaker. Now this mood can be created by leaving out important information, which can cause the audience to sympathize with people that they usually wouldn't. Yet, even while the audience is taken to a really specific place, poetic films are also so subjective that each member of the audience ends up taking something different away. They can be beautiful and clever if you can make them work, but of all the six modes, poetic documentaries are the easiest to do badly and the most difficult to do well. For a good example of this mode of storytelling, check out Baraka and Samsara. They're amazing. If you haven't seen them already, I recommend watching them straight away. There's also Godfrey Reggio's Quatsi Trilogy and Life in a Day. But in my opinion, Terence Malick's definitely king of this art form. Exposition is a wonderful thing. It lets the audience know exactly what's going on by talking directly to them, usually through narration or voiceover. It's persuasive and informative since it seems less like a point of view and more like the voice of God. So we rarely question that the person speaking is an authority that we can trust. Now this mode's easily one of the most popular forms of documentary storytelling for the simple reason that it's really hard for the audience to get lost or confused. It's pretty hard for the filmmaker to screw it up too, being so straightforward. You're looking at an image, someone's telling you about it. Now you'll see this mode used in any number of history or space or wildlife, any documentaries really. Examples are everywhere. Just watch Nat Geo or the History Channel, March of the Penguins, Blue Planet, Cosmos, or even Beer Wars. David Attenborough is outstanding in this field. This is sometimes referred to as fly-on-the-wall filmmaking. The observational method is exactly what it sounds like. It's a window on the world. It's unobtrusive and the subject goes about their day as if the cameras aren't even there. And this is a way to capture a scene or a moment or a society as accurately as possible. But it can also be very intimate. It's voyeuristic. You feel like you're peeking through someone's fence. And it's that feeling that made TV shows like Big Brother and Love Island so popular. Now, unlike poetic documentaries, the observational mode is the most factual and therefore it's the most relatable. It becomes very real and emotional for the viewer, especially if we're witnessing something traumatic or embarrassing or even heartwarming. Now, Frederick Wiseman's 1968 classic High School is a great early example to have a look at. Also, Armadillo, Steve James's Hoop Dreams, Mr. Gaga, or the 2011 film Knuckle about Irish bare knuckle boxing. I mean, if you, if you want to see commitment to filmmaking, it was shot over 12 years. This mode of storytelling is a little bit more ego driven, in my opinion. That being said, it's one I use a lot, so I don't know what that says. Participatory documentaries are exactly what they sound like as well. The filmmaker is actually a character in the movie, participating, which can make the opinions expressed in the film biased, but it can also be pretty compelling because there's passion behind the opinion. Participatory documentaries set out to imply that the filmmaker's presence and the very act of making the film will change or at least have an impact on the subject they're covering. But that just shows you're proud of what you're making. You should believe in what you're doing, otherwise what's the point? This mode can be great if your aim is to bring to light environmental, political or social issues in which your mission is to create change with the film that you're making. But it can run the risk of coming off as a little tacky if you're just basing you know, the whole film on your own opinions without experience confirmation to back you up. So if you're jumping into this kind of film, make sure you have some decent interviews with prominent people in the field you're covering to support your opinion and give your story a little extra credibility. Again, there are countless examples of this style out there, but Ross Kemp's Afghanistan series, Bill Mayer's Religious, and Living with Michael Jackson by Bashir are all pretty good examples if you feel like checking them out.
Reflexive documentaries also include the filmmaker as a character, but rather than trying to influence events during the course of the film, they aim to influence the audience watching it. And like poetic documentaries, this can be done by omitting certain information to lead the viewer to a biased conclusion, but more often, this mode will aim to express extreme, hyper-real moments or events which, without context, the audience assumes are normal, which usually elicits disbelief and a lot of emotion. And makers of reflexive documentaries often call attention to themselves, like pointing out the fact that they're making a documentary and sometimes walking the audience through the process during it. So in a way, this mode constructs its own reality, which is clever. Its subject matter is usually challenging or confrontational, yet it's approached in a calm and reasonable manner. Louis Thoreau uses this mode a lot. By reason of Insanity, My Scientology Movie, Savile. There's also Nick Bloomfield's films like Kurt and Courtney and Biggie and Tupac. And lastly, we have performative documentaries, which are kind of like the participatory mode of storytelling with the added sprinkle of hard facts. And when I say hard, in my opinion, this is the most aggressive mode of documentary filmmaking that there is. It usually holds up a mirror to society and yells at it to stop doing something. Al Gore's inconvenient truth about climate change, uh, supersize me about the obesity epidemic in the US, um, anything by Michael Moore, where it led to revelations through the experiences and investigations and interviews conducted by the filmmaker. And it's usually pretty easy for the viewer to follow, but it's also pretty opinionated, which is gonna limit your audience depending on their own opinions. And even if you don't disagree with the subject matter, a lot of people just don't like being jabbed with a finger and being told what's wrong with them on their downtime. Now, it's a great mode of storytelling to tackle big issues and taboos, and it works really well with crime documentaries, but alienating or just annoying your audience is a very real possibility depending on your subject matter. In fact, I'd say subject matter needs to be considered more carefully here than anywhere else. Now the idea in your head probably slides directly into one or more of these modes already. You probably didn't even have to force it. And that's because we've all seen documentaries before. And even if subconsciously, we imagine and want our film to be similar to one of those that we liked. Now you probably know straight away without thinking about it, whether your film's gonna be an unbiased fly on the wall kind of thing, or an investigative, passionate journey to find the truth of some kind. But since you can already see where it fits, what would happen if you tried imagining it in another mode? And not just any mode, but the furthest, most counterintuitive mode to the one in which you see your story fitting. If your story is about climbing Everest, it should still be about climbing Everest. If it's about climate change, that shouldn't change either. Keep all the same characters, the same places, events. Think of all the same moments. Everything should stay exactly the same. Just flip the mode. If your Everest climb is a performative mode of adventure where the climbers talk to the camera and tell us what they're thinking and feeling, would those things be less clear to the audience if it were more of a fly on the wall observational piece? Or would seeing what the climbers were going through be enough without explanations needed? Could it even be better? People sympathize more with others when they think they know what that person is going through, even when what they think the person is going through is wrong. If we see a woman on the phone in tears standing outside a doctor's office, our brains put two and two together and assume the worst. We immediately think that she's probably just received an unfortunate diagnosis and we feel sympathy. If we learn the truth, that her second aunt remembered to call her on her birthday and she's just a super emotional person who coincidentally stopped to answer the phone call just outside a random doctor's office, our sympathy disappears. So sometimes allowing the audience to imagine certain things for themselves can be more powerful than bombarding them with the truth of how a character is feeling or what they're thinking about. And that's why modes are important. Essentially, they determine how much information is being passed on to the audience and in what way. Getting the sympathy of the audience is a really powerful storytelling tool. Every story is different and every mode works well in its own way, but before you decide that your documentary is 100% hands down gonna be told in the exact way you first imagined it, just try imagining it in a different mode. Slip it in a different pair of shoes and see how it looks. The six modes of documentary storytelling are great as labels, and they're important in post-production when you're working out how to pitch your film. But in my experience, most documentaries are made up of a combination of some or even all of these things. For example, a David Attenborough documentary is observational since it follows the subject's daily life with an unobtrusive camera, but it's also expository since the narration lets us know exactly what's going on with trustworthy authority. And it's even slightly poetic since 
If the film's about a gazelle and she gets chased by a lion, we hope she gets away. But if the film's about the lion, we want the lion to win so she can feed her family. So in that regard, the viewpoint of the filmmaker still sways our allegiance. But this can be applied to all documentaries. They're all gonna have some level of combination when we're talking about modes. And knowing your modes or your combination of modes also helps you to remain consistent since switching halfway through can be jarring for your audience. But try not to get too hung up on it. It'll usually happen pretty naturally. That being said, modes are great to get your head around and know about for other reasons too. We've seen that the mode you use determines how much information is conveyed to your audience. So what about truth? The difference in the volume of information you receive about any given thing can alter the way we perceive that thing dramatically. If I were describing, say, a banana to an alien, and I told him it was yellow, I wouldn't necessarily be lying, but by leaving out the fact that it's a cylindrical, bent, edible fruit, biologically a berry, high in potassium, slightly radioactive with a peelable skin and soft fleshy inside, I'm not really being as informative as I could be, am I? And in the world of documentary filmmaking, where the one implied vow is to tell the truth, how much information can reasonably be omitted before truth becomes meaningless? At first, the observational mode seems to be the most honest. And how could it not be? The filmmaker's just observing. This is probably true if you're filming wildlife in Africa or under the ocean, but what if your subject is human? If your main character knows that they're being filmed, which of course they do, otherwise it's just stalking, are they really acting the same way they would if the cameras weren't there? It's difficult to say. It's also true to say that the cameras only roll on the subject when the filmmaker chooses. So they're constructing a narrative built from moments of their choosing. It's still truth, but it's a heavily edited truth. Modes can be used to help tell your story by giving it an overall continuity. They're the car you put your audience in to take them on a journey. You can mix them up a little, sure, but once you've found your mix, stick to it. I mean, you can shoot the first act hard-hitting, performative, the second poetic, and the third observational if you like, but your audience is gonna be pretty confused by the end. Modes are guidelines. They're methods that help the filmmaker stay on course. And they have the power to elicit very different emotions in your audience, depending on which one you use. Some are more suited to certain subjects, but overall, none of them are better than the others. They all work. As I said before, have a play with them. Take your subject and see what it looks like in the most unlikely mode. You might be surprised, or at least get a few ideas. Now we'll touch on modes again a little later in the series, but next up in the pre-production section, we'll be moving on to styles, which are the ways in which you present your story in a visual medium. I hope you found this tutorial helpful, and I gave you a few things to think about for your project. I'm Matt Connor, and I'll see you in the next bit.